come now to the fifth presentation here at the camp in British Columbia, 1983, and this is the 7.30 study on Saturday night, just after Sabbath is over, as we move into the fresh week, which of course, every day which will seem like a Sabbath, won't it? Now I'd like to continue the theme we have been looking at over the past few hours in these study periods on the Sabbath day. And this will lead me to read a couple of statements, first of all, one from Desire of Ages and one from the book Christ Object Lessons. The one from the book Desire of Ages comes from the chapter dealing with the feeding of the 5,000, wherein um, Jesus, of course, established a principle of operation when he fed the 5,000 as he did. The reference is page 369, 369 in the book Desire of Ages, and I read these words. And when we are brought into straight places, we are to depend upon God. We are to, to exercise wisdom and judgment in every action of life, that we may not by reckless movements place ourselves in trial. Words well, words well worth remembering that... Um, we are not by reckless, ill-conceived movements to place ourselves in trial. We are not to plunge into difficulties, neglecting the means God has provided and misusing the faculty he has, faculties he has given us. Christ's workers are to obey his instructions implicitly. Now that's one of the main sentences in this particular statement. Christ's workers are to obey his instructions how? Implicitly. implicitly. And that means without question, without argument, without hesitation. The work is God's, and if we would bless others, his plans must be followed. Self cannot be made a centre, self can receive no honour. And that again, that next sentence which says, and if we would bless others, then what, then what follows? His plans must be followed. <clears throat> if we plan according to our own ideas the Lord will lead us to our, to our own mistakes but when after following his directions we are brought into straight places what then? he will deliver us but that's the condition of course if we follow his directions uh, or what people, but when after following his directions we are brought into straight places he will deliver us <clears throat> We are not to give up in discouragement, but in every emergency we are to seek help from him who has infinite resources at his command. Often, and not that word often, not seldom, but often, we shall be surrounded with trying circumstances and then in the fullest confidence we must depend upon God. He will keep every soul that is brought into perplexity through trying to keep the way of the Lord. Now that paragraph certainly contains some powerful instructions some very very precious promises which need to be kept in mind if we're going to bless others and do the work which God designed we shall do a shorter paragraph on page 363 in Christ Object Lessons is also very important in this context page 363 in the book Christ Object Lessons it says but when we give ourselves wholly to God and in our work follow his directions and that, note those two conditions when we give ourselves wholly to God and in our work follow his directions what then? he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment isn't that good news? right? that is very good news it means that the responsibility for the success of the work is God's concern not ours we have only one task and that is to obey orders to follow his directions when we do that then God makes himself responsible for, for, the, for the accomplishment of the work the next sentence says he would not have us conjecture as to the success of our honest endeavours that's not for us to do in other words we only ask one question what are our orders we don't ask the question will these orders bring success one of the classic examples of this, of course, is found back in the days of uh, Joshua. When Joshua went to the Lord to get directions for the overthrow of the city of Jericho, and he got a series of orders which, which on, the face, on their face value, seemed to be quite um, absurd, almost nonsensical. 
Whoever in the world heard of capturing a war city by marching silently around it once a day for six days and then the seventh day to march around that, 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 those wars seven times, blow a great trumpet, give a great shout and bring those wars tumbling down. From the human point of view, did those orders make sense? They didn't, did they? But they, they, didn't, they didn't have to worry about that. <clears throat> All they had to do was ask a simple question, what has God said to do? Not to start figuring out whether what God said to do would bring success or failure. That was not for them to do. And certainly, of course, it's not for us to do either down here at this point of time. <clears throat> now, having read those two very wonderful statements, which contain commands and promises, I'd like to now move out into a an area which is very close, was well, part of the same study, of course. Now, on page 668, Sister Wise says, All true obedience comes from where? The heart. It was heart work with Jesus. And if we consent, he will so blend himself with our thoughts and aims, and when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. I'd like to read on from that uh, point a little further, because. Um, the next part of the statement brings us to um, a very important aspect of this principle. It goes on to say, The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Will find its highest what? Delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience to an appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God sin will become hateful to us when the statement says all true obedience comes from the heart does this infer that there is another kind of obedience which is not true obedience and yet is still obedience it does does not so there's true obedience which God can accept and there's obedience which God certainly cannot accept in Great Controversy page 498 in that uh, tremendous chapter on the origin of evil there's a statement there which to my mind carries new depth of meaning this evening to me personally and I hope it does to you as well it talks about the only kind of service that God can accept it says that since the service of love can alone be acceptable to God the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence so the kind of obedience that marks a holy person, together with his faith of course, is that kind of obedience which is the outworking of an inward spirit. And I call it the spirit of obedience, right? The spirit of obedience. If we go now to Ephesians, the um, second chapter, we find Paul making a reference there to the spirit of disobedience which of course marked the character of the sinful world around him in those days and likewise marks the character of the sinful world around us today. Ephesians the second chapter, we'll read verses 1 and 2 and 3, particularly of course verse 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, that those, those words, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And that those words, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, now what is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience? It is the spirit of disobedience. Is that right? Otherwise called the spirit of rebellion. And um, Paul talks about the time when we, when, when we were by nature the children of wrath. We were that kind of person in ourselves. Now what kind of... Now it is possible for a person with the spirit of, of disobedience to obey the Ten Commandments. It is possible, yes. Not according to... Uh, not to God's standard, of course, but he can obey the Ten Commandments it can be done by forcing himself to work contrary to his own nature. The same as you can train, for instance, a child 
to obey by using the power of force and such like. For instance, let's get away from children for the moment. When, <clears throat> when young men who have led a completely lawless life, up until, well, mostly a lawless life up, up until military age, are inducted into the army, then the army has a way by using brute force and other means of persuasion of, of disciplining those young men until they obey every command given to them they'll even go out and, and get themselves killed as they obey the orders given to them now when they obey those orders are they acting out their nature or are they acting contrary to their nature they're acting contrary to their nature aren't they their obedience is a forced obedience and that kind of obedience God is never ever going to accept now this brings to light a very, very important question so far as child training is concerned. And it's a very natural question to raise at this point in our consideration of these, of these things. A number of years ago when I first went to Portugal, the, there, was, there was, as there still is, quite a, a, a family of children, all the way from babes in arms up to, uh, at that time, about possibly 10 or 11 years of age. Today there's still babies in arms and uh, not the same ones of course because <laughs> the ones who were babies in arms have now become three and four year olds and uh, there's a new batch of babies in arms which have followed on in their footsteps and of course the 10 and 11s have become 13 and 14 year old children and back when I first went to Portugal those children were hopelessly misbehaved and the meetings were a positive trial to take because we, we very often had to um, meet in rooms that had bad acoustics and there was echoes around and when a child cried it was extremely difficult to talk above that child and, and, it, and there seemed to be so much, so much um, unrest amongst the children, so much uh, fussing around that taking the meeting was a positive difficulty and we, I, but I patiently endured, or at least I hope I patiently endured it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did anyway, let's say it that way. So anyway the parents came to me, well first of all I more or less said to myself well it would take a lifetime to teach these parents how to bring up these children right and furthermore the disadvantages that these Portuguese folk face and their very limited accommodation would make it almost impossible for those poor kids to ever have a decent natural upbringing. Now Portuguese folk in Lisbon where all our believers are scattered around Lisbon they have to stay there because of work problems there's nothing out on the farm because the farms are so small that the man who owns them farms them and so there's no work out in the country. And they live in tiny apartments, probably about um, 12 feet wide and maybe 25 to 30 feet long, consisting of one bedroom, one bathroom, one little kitchen, one dining room and a balcony at each end. And uh, the children can't go down to the street to play because it's filled with motor, motor vehicles racing around and uh, so they, they more or less spend their life in prison. And I thought to myself, well how can these poor children ever hope to have a decent natural upbringing? Anyway, the parents did ask me to give a talk on uh, bringing up children and I forgot now what I told them back at that point of time. But this year when I went back, I was absolutely amazed to find that um, the difference in the behaviour of those children, amazed beyond all possibility, because from the littlest to the eldest, and that meant from babies in arms up to 12 and 13 year olds, a lot of children, in fact I'll bring some photographs tomorrow, you can see those actual children to, to get some idea of how small most of them are, and they sat with their parents in what I would describe as virtually perfect behaviour through every one of 37 study periods. Just sat there, perfectly behaved. I couldn't believe it. I'm still shaking my head in wonder. <laughs> it was amazing and I don't know how they did it. But the children seemed to behave from a, from a, a very natural spirit of obedience. The parents didn't have to tie them down or threaten them. They just seemed to obey because it was in them to obey. And that set my mind to working, especially when I came to the Quebec conference and uh, <laughs> I met Portugal as it was four or five years ago. Because they too have a, uh, have a group of very active children and, um, a very, and very untrained, unconverted children I would say. And I was surprised how on Sabbath morning when those children fussed and so forth how the Spirit of God seemed to lead that place to, me, to a lot of hard work to, to to encourage the Spirit of God back again because obviously of course if the children have in them the spirit of disobedience then every child in whom is the spirit of disobedience is a natural agent whereby Satan can enter right into a meeting room isn't that right? you think it through 
Now, this reminds me of that scripture back in Proverbs chapter 22. Let's go back there and uh, read a, a well-known text you've read it many, many times before. Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. And I must say that I wish that um, I had uh, the information which I'm now going to talk about or offer to you folk when I was a young man thinking of marriage and planning to have a family and so forth. The 22nd chapter of Proverbs, verse 6, and the statement says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Now, what would you say is the key word in this particular verse? What, t what one word strikes you most strongly? Train. Train? Not me. Just to, just to be different, I suppose. Way is the word I'm thinking of. The word way has become very important to us because having read Hebrews, the third chapter, or yes, the third chapter, where we read there that, they, that the Israelites did not know God's way. And because they didn't know God's way, what was the result? They could not enter into his rest. So there's a very definite connection between God's way and God's rest. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's think this through now for a moment or two and let's recognize the reason for our seeing so many of our children lost from the fall when they come to be teenagers, when they start to exercise their own will, and take care of themselves much, much sooner than they should of course but they do it anyway and there's many a parent who has devoted uh, endless hours to bringing up the children during the previous uh, 15 to 16 years and they were quite confident that when they got to be 15 and 16 they would, they would go in the way that they were supposed to go because hadn't they told them about the Sabbath hadn't they given them good food to eat hadn't, hadn't they uh, taught them the life of Christ and so forth and so on so why if they taught them all these things then they continue in the way of those things when they became teenagers now <clears throat> let's now look at um, this in the following fashion we'll divide the life of the child into two parts and this is the dividing line on the board tonight the first part is from birth to adolescence or to okay we'll put the word adolescence can't fit it in this C N C, isn't it? Or S C. That'll do anyway. Do you know what it means? <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the rest of the child's life from that point of time on. Okay. Now, during the rest of the child's life, we expect him or her to grow up to be a Christian. And um, the way of the Christian is obedience from the heart obedience without force isn't that right that's the way of the Christian that's the only kind of obedience that God is interested in and obedience which comes from a spirit of obedience within now in order to achieve that objective and that's, that's the objective isn't it to make Christians out of our young people out of our children right now to achieve that objective how do we how do, what, what was the way we trained those children in during the previous 13 or 14 years the way of force now does that make sense you, you get my point in other words if we spend 15 years using force parental authority to uh, against the, against the spirit of the child to prepare him to live the rest of his life without being forced to obey is that is that going to work you just think it through is that going to work yeah. the Bible says train up the child in the way that he should go right and this and we trained up our children I confess I did it myself in the way of rules and regulations and the way of force we said to the child I'm the parent you're the child you do as you say or else is that right or well, maybe 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 of course there are other parents who say to the child do what you like I can't control you anyway <laughs> and then you go well, then, then what have you got obedience or anarchy anarchy or lawlessness or rebellion and uh, today of course we see all too many families especially out in the world where the children uh, the children are in command there's no question about that the children are in command and the parents obey the children the children don't, uh, don't obey the parents have you seen it? who hasn't seen it right? the children are, com are completely uncontrolled 
And there's the other situation where the parents, in some families, the parents do exercise um, control by the use of force. And that, of course, is better by far than rebellion or anarchy or lawlessness entirely. Now, I was very impressed a few years ago when there was, like, I think, the coronation or, the, or a wedding or something in the British royal family. And... Um, <clears throat> The the uh, the young Prince Charles, I think it was at that time. He's now, of course, a grown ma grown man, married with uh, with the heir to the throne. And during this ceremony, he stood there for a long time without fussing, without moving, and so forth. And in the newspaper, there's some comment about this, and uh, some remarks about the kind of training or discipline that that the prince has to endure in order to be fit for the English throne. And uh, the observation was made that uh, training can achieve wonderful things. You can, you can train dogs and animals to do marvellous things and they be, can become very disciplined and so forth. And I was very impressed by that at the time. But as I think about it today, I, I recognise, and you recognise too, that when a child is born, he is born with a spirit of rebellion in him and the spirit of rebellion in her. Isn't that right? We're all born that way because of the inheritance that comes down from us from disobedient Adam in the Garden of Eden and because we're Satan's offspring on the spiritual side there works in us the spirit of disobedience and while that spirit is there any uh, obedience that you get by using discipline or training or force is curbing or controlling that spirit and, and the the obedience which you're getting is not the kind of obedience which is what which which God will accept, is it? It's not the kind of obedience. Therefore, in order for a parent to be successful in bringing up his child in the way that he should go later, in other words, this way back here has to be a training in this later way. Isn't that right? This way back here, from birth to adolescence, must be a training in the way that he shall go later. So having had 15 years, or 16 years the case may be, wherein the child has been established in the way of God, then what will he do for the rest of his life according to the promise? He will walk in that way. Because the scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Now are you clearly seeing tonight the difference between a forced obedience and a and one that comes from the very heart itself. Let me repeat an illustration I've used before. Maybe I just need to mention and you'll all remember, remember the story. But anyway, if we were to board, shall we say, a 747 and all go to the Australian camp meeting, which is all right to do, I'm sure. <laughs> we do speak English down there, believe it or not. <laughs> Some people call it Strine. <clears throat> Otherwise it's called Australian. Now, when we went to the aircraft washroom, we find a sign which says no smoking in the aircraft toilets. All right? Now, you wouldn't smoke in the aircraft toilet, neither do I. Why not? Because the sign said so? Not at all. The presence of the sign would make no difference to your behaviour whatsoever, not in the slightest degree. We would not smoke in, in the toilet because we don't smoke anyway. It's not in us to smoke. There's no disposition there to do it. So our obeying that sign would be, but the res would be but a response to the spirit that's in us, the spirit of our obedience to the principle of non-smoking. Now after we left the room, another man comes along who is, who is a, um, a chain smoker, shall we say, and he reads the sign and he doesn't smoke either. Now why doesn't he smoke? Because of his nature or because of the sign? Because of the authority in that sign. Because he respects that sign because he doesn't want to suffer the punishment that disobedience might bring to him. So he obeys against his nature. Isn't that right? He obeys against his nature. So, so in both cases, the sign is obeyed. We don't smoke there, he doesn't smoke there, and so both render the same uh, outward obedience. But, but, the, but the obedience, of course, is very different because one does it from within, the other does it from without. And obviously, of course, God is not going to have up in heaven a whole great big bunch of thou shalt not smoke signs, is he? Yeah. So therefore, he can't allow folk to go up there who need signs to tell them not to smoke. He can't permit that. And the same is true of every one of those Ten Commandments. For instance, if you have the love of God in your heart, 
So do you forgive your enemy even before he asks to be forgiven, if he ever does ask to be forgiven? If you treat him as though he'd never committed the wrong against you, if you render him good for evil, if you pray for him, if you do all you can to help him, and that is the natural outspringing of your nature, then do you need to be told thou shalt not kill him? That's completely superfluous, isn't it? That's totally and completely superfluous. Now, <clears throat> what then is the objective of parental training to produce the child who doesn't smoke because the law says don't do it, or the child who doesn't do it because it's in him not to do it? What, what is the objective of the gospel? What is the objective of all parental training? The answer is obvious, isn't it? Now this means then that um, the parent must realise that what his child needs, what their child needs, does mother and father need to recognise this, this point of this principle, what um, the child needs is to have in him the spirit of obedience. Now that spirit cannot be trained into a child, that's an impossibility. There's only one way to get the spirit of obedience and that is, and that is in which way? By the miracle working, saving, transforming power of the gospel. Isn't that right? There's no other way. Because that spirit of obedience finds a source in God, the same as we read from um, Acts of the Apostles, page 551, that supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another is the, is the greatest gift that heaven can bestow. Now that's, that, that comes to us only as a gift from God and likewise the spirit of obedience can come to us from God and from God alone. Same as the new heart comes from the same source and there's no other place from which it can be obtained. It is the seed of Christ and so forth. Let's turn back to the Desire of Ages 3, uh, 3.11 for a moment, for instance, to, um, to note uh, a promise in this respect, <clears throat> a promise which has been always of great comfort and strength and very precious to me personally. Now I'll read a little bit of the context to the statement beginning back uh, on the second full paragraph which says, God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. And then is quoted the verse from Matthew 5, verse 48. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now there are two words that I'd like to emphasize. The first one is be perfect. Now what does the word be indicate? A state of being, doesn't it? Right, that's a state of being. Be perfect even as, there's that word again, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And once again, it doesn't say God does perfect things, it says God is perfect in his very nature. Then the statement says, this command is a promise. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper a Christ-like life is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. A holy temper. Now, if you have a holy temper, does this mean you have a spirit of obedience? I would certainly think so. The two things go together very intimately and closely. So if God promises to give to us as a gift a holy temper, then we can reach out by faith and claim that blessing for ourselves. And find implanted in us of course the spirit of obedience so it would be our absolute delight to obey the word of God I'd like to read from 258 in the book Education where the same thought is brought through very strongly and very clearly in the same respect <clears throat> here Sister White says for the pardon of sin for the Holy Spirit for a Christ-like temper for wisdom and strength to do his work for any gift he has promised we may ask then we are to believe that we receive and return thanks to God that we have received. Now the possession of a holy temper is of course the possession of an inner quality and an inner, inner life and inner power. How then shall parents who love their children 
ensure that those children are blessed with a holy temper. Um, a, big part of a spirit of obedience and of course a holy temper too. Now first of all, the parents must themselves be blessed with that which they desire their child to have. No one can lead a soul to Christ who has not found Christ himself first. That's very clear and plain. In Desire of Ages, page 805, for instance, Sister White there says that only those who are possessed of the attributes of Jesus Christ, only those in whom the Spirit of God has worked in and turned in ministers of the Gospel to lead others to the Saviour. And you can't lead the, the sinner to him whom you never have met yourself. That's quite impossible. And so then the parents themselves must have experienced the transforming grace of God. They must in fact be born again Christians and if nothing else should be an incentive to gain that experience, of course, the welfare of your children should certainly be that kind of incentive. The more I think about this, of course, the more I realise that as the parent helps to save the child, so in fact the child in turn helps to save the parent. <clears throat> now having come to the place where the parents, first of all, have experienced this, this transformation that they themselves have now been blessed with the spirit of obedience and they have thereby come to, to know the power of God and to see the power of God then, then they are qualified to lead the child into the same experience as they, they themselves ha have and the younger the child is the better their chances of doing it because the older the child becomes, the more that spirit of rebellion, rebellion has become embedded in him, the more he uh, loses dispositions or desires to gain the spirit of obedience, and therefore the more difficult it becomes for the parents to lead him into that experience. Now the next thing is for the parent to discern the child's need, and that's not difficult, believe you me. I'm sure that... Um, especially after the study tonight, if you take the trouble to observe children's reactions to their parents' directives and commands, it's not very difficult to discern when the spirit of disobedience manifests itself, is it? That's, that's not very hard. When, when the parent um, asks the child to do something and that child uh, resists and uh, turns away and uh, shakes his head for a start, that's just starters of course, and a little more pressure is applied, then, then comes the, the fussing and the screaming and the uh, and, and the manifestations of uh, protest against the parent and when you see that you can know that in that child is a spirit of disobedience and the biggest mistake we can possibly make is well, not the biggest mistake the biggest mistake is let the child just let it go let it, let it manifest itself and do what it likes the next, the next biggest mistake is to endeavour by force to compel that child to do what you want him to do that's the next biggest mistake <laughs> And uh, I must plainly confess that there was a time when I did teach that um, we should enforce our will upon the child, let the child know who the master is, and gain obedience in that fashion. Now that, that was better counsel of course than anarchy, but it still wasn't the best counsel. What I'm telling you tonight is to supersede and cancel out what I told you before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a frank confession, isn't it? <laughs> I hope it is. <laughs> So when, when the parent detects in the child that, um, that spirit, the first thing to do is to send a silent prayer to God or even go aside for the moment and, and uh, both parents together preferably, if, if possible, to kneel down and say, now Lord, we've got a problem on our hands. Our child is manifesting a spirit of disobedience and according to your instructions, we'll now bring this child before you and on its behalf, we will seek that spirit of obedience for it. And then bring the child, just quietly ask the child to come with you and forget all about the issue that was, you were being fought, fought, fighting over a few moments ago or about to fight over a few moments ago. And uh, of course if it's still just a baby in arms a couple of days old and babies in arms two days old can certainly manifest, I've seen them do it and you folk have seen them do it too, that spirit of disobedience, don't they? Right at the very beginning of their life they'll manifest that spirit and let you know in no uncertain terms that they're asserting their authority and they're, and they're aiming to take the position of boss in the house and will do so if you don't do something about it. So if that's the case, then kneel down beside that baby's crib and pray aloud and, and do so with a very positive and definite faith. Now when you come to pray, 
remember that you must have in your minds the promises of God you must believe in those promises they must be your possession and you come there on the basis of those promises promises where the Lord says I will save your children just forgotten the reference to that text you, you, you all read it haven't you because I will save your children there's only one way God can save our children that is to get that spirit of disobedience out of them and put the spirit of, spirit of obedience into them and there pray aloud and confess on that infant's behalf its, its uh, existing spirit of disobedience and then give God that spirit of disobedience because a child can't do it for itself you alone can do it for the child at that stage and, and this is quite legitimate because you are the will of that child the, 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 the choice power of the child and the faith of that child or faith for that child at this point of time you stand completely in that child's place as a, as a mediator and then having <clears throat> asked God to put that spirit into the child believe he's done this because he's promised and thank him that he has done it and believe that he has done it and if you find you can't believe it then go back to the promises of God until you can believe it and ask God to build a new faith to lay hold upon God's promise to save your children now this doesn't mean that uh, that's going to be the last manifestation that you may see that child exhibiting and if the child should later exhibit again in a, probably in a much milder form a spirit of disobedience then don't be discouraged about that nor surprised because as you remember of course after we were born again we still found that there are other problems that we had to face other sins to be cleansed away from us deep seated habits to be rooted out and so forth and so there will be successive cleansing the child may need as time goes by and each time the child manifests any spirit of disobedience kneel down be beside his bed and in strong faith claim another cleansing and another infilling of the spirit of obedience and God will answer the prayer of faith and God will save our children and we have now taken some very very strong steps in training up the child in the way that he, he should go which is not of course the way of force is it but it's the way of love now don't feel however that we've now we've now won the battle completely that that's all we have to do because the word train that we find in, in Proverbs 22 and verse 6 involves education and true obedience is a matter of the mind as well as of the spirit now there are two reasons why you don't smoke if we come back to the simple illustration one reason is because there's no taste or disposition in you to do it but another reason is because your mind has been educated against that habit and practice has it not so so we have a double protection an intellectual protection or mental protection on the one side and a spiritual protection upon the other side a double ceiling as you might say it now becomes necessary for the parents to um, train the child <clears throat> in the way that he should go that is intellectually to form habits now of industry habits of uh, order habits of discipline habits of um, uh, or taste I should better say for um, the right kind of reading the right kind of food the right kind of everything and I found that um, when the parents themselves have a well ordered home for instance if uh, they have a, a fairly, fairly regular time for rising and breakfast is at a specific time and the child learns to know it comes at that particular hour and when the parents sit down with that kind of purposeful intent we've come here to eat this is, this is the time to eat that's what we're here for and we go about the business um, with dispatch and, um, and thoroughness and um, if the child doesn't want to eat well, that's his freedom it doesn't have to but it doesn't eat again until midday or when, it, when the next meal is due and uh, the child is warned just once that um, the next meal is so many hours away and when that time comes we'll eat again and if that child has to suffer a few pains of hunger waiting for the next meal to come next breakfast time he's very careful to make sure he eats well and so so, so he's being trained not by force but by, um, by natural discipline to, to work in, in right lines and you'll find that um, when, you, when the parents wisely surround the child with a, 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 a very well ordered home atmosphere in which there's no um, big voice of authority but we just do these things together and we do it from a spirit of obedience and whenever any problem arises to take that to the Lord and get rid of it then you'll find that um, 
I, I'm, I know that you'll find that the child will manifest or will grow up as a very beautiful thing and there'll be a lovely there'll be a, love, a lovely love relationship between the parents and the children involved now for instance um, when I present these things I'm a little bit nervous sometimes because I wonder if people really apply them or when they'll, when they'll half, halfway apply them and then come back and say well the message didn't work so it's not worth anything and you'd imagine my gratification therefore when during the camp in California when I presented these same thoughts to the people down there one mother who had considerable trouble with a child came to me and, um, and, and told me this but before I tell you what she told me she had a little child of about I think about nine months or perhaps a year old about nine months I'd, yeah, about nine months I'd say getting close to a year I'm not very good at guessing baby's ages <laughs> and um, through every meeting that child used to fuss and fuss and fuss and so she'd pick it up and take it outside she'd walk up and down outside where she'd hear the study from through the loudspeakers and she'd do this meeting after meeting after meeting and the father would take turns doing it with her and I noticed this and then the mother came to me about two days after I presented the study down there and she said well she said I want to really thank you for those thoughts on child training because um, I took the baby home and we knelt down beside it and we confessed its uh, spirit of disobedience and we asked God to take that away, we gave it to God and, and then to put into the spirit of obedience and she said the difference, she said, is absolutely amazing. And I noticed too that um, she was now sitting through the meetings, mostly, there was, there was some time when the child got a little restless but generally speaking it uh, behaved itself quite well. And the difference was indeed astonishing and, and it went on day after day till the camp was ended and there was a very, very grateful and happy mother who found that that approach to the problem was indeed working. Now, I look with great envy upon the young people today who have uh, very young families and with greater envy upon those who are yet to get married and um, have their families because it's available to you knowledge of this nature which was completely hidden from us when I was a young man contemplating marriage and in turn contemplating the having of a family and I'd give anything to go back today 40 years or more and start again provided I could know in doing that what I now know and um, I, I know that um, I know that my children would grow up to be far more obedient far more loving far more responsive to God's principles and they did grow up to be but on the other hand I do claim the promise which I'll talk about tomorrow morning a promise to comfort those of us who have who now look back on failures in child, child training because the Lord has promised to make up the years which have been lost to the canker worm and the great wasting army which you read about in the second chapter of the book of Joel when I think of what God did for King Nebuchadnezzar how God set up situations because of the presence of a faithful Daniel and the obedient Daniel or a holy Daniel if God could do for Nebuchadnezzar what God did for him and effect a marvellous con conversion so that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in the kingdom then I know that God can send his mighty Holy Spirit to, to plead with and work upon the hearts of our young people especially when we learn to be holy men and women which means obedient uh, and faithful because obedience and faith are the, are the marks of a holy person and, God, and the effectual fervent and prayer of a righteous man as we know about it a great deal so I do trust that these thoughts this evening on how to, how to train up a child in the way that he shall go will be of great value to us and we'll see a great improvement not that I'm complaining about the behaviour of children here but uh, there's always room for improvement you know and no matter how good things may be and therefore I, I'm looking forward to seeing much more happily united families in the coming months and years of our sojourn down here upon this sin cursed earth so may God bless you each one that you may be very successful and happy parents and the future is my prayer tonight now maybe the study might um, invoke some questions or even objections or other ideas so if you have any questions we'd be glad to uh, discuss them yes Anna okay it's fine you take the child and you pray over him or with him if he's old enough to pray and then you get up off your knees and he's just as disobedient and rebellious as you started what do you do start it all over again and well, over and over again until he finally succumbs and says, all right, I give up, I'll <laughs> Well, now, first of all, it depends how old the child is. If the, if the child is old enough to, to, to discuss the matter, um, like four and five and six and seven years of age and more, then I sit down with the child and I say, now, look, um, 
you just manifested a few moments ago a very, I, I just described to him what he went through and say, so now you did this and this and that, you pulled a face, you screamed and so forth. Now that wasn't very nice behaviour, was it? You know, say to the child. And then I would talk to him for a little while about the kind of behaviour that God alone can accept and the kind of behaviour which alone will enter the kingdom and ask him, now do you really want to be this kind of person? And you'll find that, that uh, particularly if, you, if your own heart is filled with God's love and you yourself have the spirit of obedience and faith, that that child will respond very positively. That's been my experience with little children, very positively. In fact, at the Quebec camp where I first began to really see this principle of training up a child in the way that he should go, there was a, a girl there about probably 12 years of age whose parents had, had a lot of trouble with her, a great deal of trouble with her because of a spirit of rebellion. And, um, and they talked with me about it in her very presence. And I said to her, well, now, is that the kind of person you really want to be? No, she said, I can't help it. I don't want to be that kind of person. Well, I said, very good. And then I told the parents how to, how the three of them could go aside and